Well, good to see you. I'm joking out. I've known you 40 years. I've been pursuing you for about 30 of those years to come on my show, and you've never done it until well, now. I know, but I didn't know it was the Labour Party conference. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I was absolutely fooled. I thought old Rick here was from Eton, and this one was from... <laughs> okay. I first saw you in a movie. i tell you what the movie was. It was about 50 years ago called Hell Drivers. Eh? Yes, and what else? No, Stanley Baker, Patrick McGowan, uh, yeah. and yeah, was, Peggy Cummings. Okay. There you are, I can yeah. remember all those years ago. But, I mean, that's the point. I mean, who'd have thought? You, did you think when you were making that movie that, you know, 50 years on, the age of 73, you'd still be this, you're this huge star? Well, uh, to be honest, I never thought I would reach 73. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we talk about this, my wife and I, and uh, we both mutually agree that um, we're not really in our 70s. We're closer to three. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, because it's difficult to... I hear, and she says, Things come out in the papers, and people talk about this, and elderly, and what have you, and they're in their 60s. Yeah. Well, where does it put us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose it's in the mind. I think that's very much so. And, mm. and, and in being active and keeping working, too, which is very important. Oh, yes, it's nice, the money. I mean... <laughs> The other thing too, I mean, I mean, I mean, you've you got reached the age of seventy-three without losing it in the sense that you know you've been voted the sexiest man of the century, for God's sake. Well, they have great taste. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take that. Yeah, seriously. Well, it's very rare, actually, Sean. You have a show where all four of us are sex symbols. <laughs> what did you say? I'm not working. I'm not I <laughs> right, let's, I mean, the, the, there you are. I mean, the, the latest film, again, is an action movie. I mean, it's, no. you, you, you don't just continue career, you continue you know, playing action heroes. You obviously like that genre of movie. Yeah, yeah, the, yes. <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of interesting that I don't have a problem in going into any kind of clothes or no clothes for films uh, in terms of being concerned about um, period films or whatever. And I think that if um, you have that attitude, it's much easier to make the transition, whether it's period uh, or whatever. Some uh, actors, I think, have the, uh, impose a self-limitation by being uncomfortable in a toga or monk's habit or whatever. And I think that you have to make the leap. You have to make uh, of yourself to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the most important stage to learn as an actor. Is it? Yes, to make an absolute of yourself. <laughs> or a, of yourself. <laughs> I know you're censored here. So not at all, we're not. You're well, free, you go for it, Sean. There's no problem at all here. Right. All right, well, being a... <laughs> <laughs> The one word, the one word you want to ask you. <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> and I got it. Okay. <laughs> so, the film... <laughs> the film is called The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yes. And it's based on a... on what they call those picture books, isn't it? Those, yeah. Uh, what we used to call comic books, comic like books. the Dandy and the Beano, yeah. but they're quite different now. Yeah. They they're are. much more upmarket and... In fact, they do better deals than Ulysses, Joyce, and what have you, because they make it's wonderful quality, uh, the same as if you're making a movie, where they do these preparations. Uh, the photography on it, mm. it's unbelievable. Mm. I mean, they're very expensive, but it's good quality stuff. When you were a, a child in, uh, in, in Edinburgh, was the cinema an informative, a, a formative part of your, your Oh, yeah, was yeah, it? without question. And they used to see uh, main feature, second feature, the trailer, the news, right. and you could spend a week there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see, you got the pictures, you got rid of it, and you'd come back uh, four hours later. They well, didn't little... seem to worry, actually, then. No. Maybe they were hoping. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different society. You were safer then, that's, that's for sure. Uh, Although maybe where you lived, you weren't so safe. I mean, it was a federal affair, wasn't it? You lived in a tenement? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but <clears throat> it's very difficult to uh, 
equate with anywhere else if you have nothing to compare it with. Sure. And uh, people who talk about hardships and, you know, all joking aside about Eaton and uh, Rick's situation at Liverpool, that you don't know anything else. So what do you compare it with? Sure. And so you get on with it. It's only when you get outside, and really that's what makes the world go round. It's the people that go outside, and but not enough of them come back and try to change what's wrong inside. Yeah, yeah. But, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, do you do that? Yes, I do it all my life. I've done it. In what sense? Well, I believe that the identity and everything to do with the Scottish psyche, health, future and everything is based on independence. And so I've been a, an investor in that with myself, uh, financially, emotionally, and I've taken a lot of batterings for it, <laughs> but um, I believe it's, it's worth it. But you see, reading about you, it seems to me that you always had an urge to better yourself in that sense. I mean, you started work yeah. at nine yeah. with a milk yeah. round. It's a part of the, uh, the environment and what have you that you're in. And you have a drive to get and do something better. When you go outside, you see how the prejudices. But did you ever imagine, I mean, let's talk about two things. The, the one thing that really um, interests me about you is the way that Ricky was talking about self-education. And you actually decided to educate yourself, didn't you? Because mm. you didn't go to school, there wasn't a school at one point, the schools were closed, That's right? right? Uh, so you had little or no formal education at all. At what point do you decide that this is the way out, that education is the way, and I'm going to educate myself? Well, I worked, uh, left school at 13, so I, the war changed everything because it was uh, just straightforward economics. You had to do what you could do, and so I drove a horse and cart and made some money. I couldn't wait to go to the war. That's how smart I was. <laughs> eh? And then I did go and uh, had no real future in it. Came back. I was on tour in South Pacific, and I didn't know really what I wanted to do, but I was having a great time traveling on a motorbike all over the UK in a theater show. Yes. And an American, uh, Robert Henderson, was in the play. Suddenly he said, why don't you want to be an actor? And I said, well, I'm me an actor to do what? He said, I see you, you do what you do and everything. I was doing handsprings and all the boots bull, you know, on the stage, with nothing like a dame and everything. And suddenly I said, well, what would I have to do? He said, well, first of all, you're totally illiterate. So <laughs> it's necessary that you would have to have to work on your voice. You'd have to learn to speak and you would have to give yourself an education, which I'd never had. So he gave me 10 titles covering uh, from all Shaw, all Shakespeare, an actor prepares, Jean Christophe, my life in art, uh, remembrance of things past. I read them all. I went to the libraries in every town up and down Britain, and I extended my time on tour to complete it. And at the end of the day, I came back to London with a bicycle and about 90 quid in the bank no phone at home, no check in the post, and became an actor. What, how do you, he said, alter your voice, change your voice, how do you do that? No, I had to, I was no, talking no, like that, that. Yeah, I was talking about it, but it was like that, you hear the news, you hear the Scottish <laughs> game, so it's like, but Eric Sykes told me a marvelous story when he was in the army, he said he was going to Dunkirk or somewhere, he said there was a group of guys, and they were all talking, and he was sure they were Polish. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a Scottish guy going over. Uh, you know. Anyway, so I had to change that. But I would never, I could never want to lose the uh, sound, the music of what Scottish speaking is. And you've, of course, what you've never done in movies is change your voice. Isn't it? That's right. You've absolutely, yeah. in every part you've Because played. the emotion should be the same internationally. That's what I believe. Right. A Russian is the same as a Scottish. The same as an Irish or a Pole, even the English. 
<laughs> I no. waited 40 years to, to talk to, to him. I, to <laughs> Let me tell you something. What? He will not remember what? where we met. Uh, we met, we, we met first of all, I think on a golf course, but then we met at no, Leeds, no, no, when no, Leeds no. played Celtic. Yes? Are you getting closer? And we had a bet on a, on the result of a match, and you kept sending me letters saying, you owe me now ten pounds plus four percent compound interest. <laughs> right? And I got these letters follow me all around like a bailiff. <laughs> and in the end you shamed me into writing to you and sending a cheque, I think. Is yeah. that right? Well, it's a very Okay, that's your story. Oh. Let me tell you the real story. <laughs> The story is we're in a house of Marshall Bellow, no, yes, right. Ian Brill, yeah. the whole crowd of us were all soccer fiends and golf fiends. He didn't play golf then. And we had a discussion about Tommy Doherty and Dave Sexton. And you were telling me how useless Doherty was and how wonderful Sexton was. And the bet was not on Celtic and Leeds, but on I said Doherty, who was then manager of Manchester United, would finish higher in the league than anybody else. And I said, you can take the rest. And he said, no, I'll take Sexton, who I think was with Chelsea or Queen's Park Rangers. And I never got a check. I never got a penny. So I decided after a period of time, and I met Mary, his wife, in Marbella. That's disgraceful. And he put, he was writing, and he didn't play golf, and he wrote about something or other and said uh, that his wife had said I had wonderful legs. <laughs> which, which is true. Well, was it? <laughs> anyway, I wrote him a letter, not lots of letters. I wouldn't waste the stamps on that. <laughs> I sent him a letter saying that I've been waiting for a reply. My money, plus interest, and if I don't get satisfaction, I'm going to show Mary the rest. <laughs> well, I, I, I've completely forgotten that, Sean. Sure. <laughs> I've completely Have you paid that? Yeah. Have you got that? He paid uh, me. He paid, paid me at a golf sure, tournament, sure, sure. which he decried as being an old man's game. And now he's a better golfer than me. No nonsense. Yes, he is. No, I don't. I don't no. have. No, no. Okay, no, I'm no, sorry. No, I'm, I'm not running, as competitive as you are. Sure, I mean, you're, now, just a couple of, of, of questions because I, I did want to ask you about about the effect that Bond had on your life. It should have changed your life, career, didn't it? Totally, James Bond. Oh, that would go strong. <laughs> um, yes, it did. Yes, it did, enormously. Uh, I would never have recognized it at the time, and anybody who was really honest, and that's including United Artists, Saltzman, Broccoli, and all the rest of them, none of them anticipated the success it was going to be. And Fleming didn't want you, did he? No, no, of course not. He went to Eton. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're playing an Etonian. So did yeah. Bond. And he was so did Bond. Yeah. That's right. Well, of course, he wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> I have no You're a wonderful editor. Thank you. I hope you're going to be the chief of the party. I mean, what, what that gave you actually was the, the Bond thing, was that gave you that wonderful thing, independence. Because, I mean, my view of you is that you've actually made the industry work for you, basically, rather than you work for the industry, which is a, that you have that kind of independence. And allow you to make some very good films. I mean, one of my favourite films of yours is, is The Hill. Which I think is a magnificent movie, and I, and I love, of course, the Kane movie that you made. Uh, oh, Man Who Will, Man be, Will King. be King. Yeah, well, that's. Uh, I think what's interesting about the movie that it was a great pleasure to do it, and that doesn't happen a lot on movies. Well, he, he, he supported that when I, when I talked to him. He also said that you were his dancing partner at one point. You, were, you had a dance. No, too. I didn't dance with him. I danced with his driver. Ah. The driver was prettier than he. <laughs> <laughs> We were in Morocco, so it was, you know. It was all right. Yeah. Everything was all right. <laughs> it, was, it would have been okay at the Eaton Ball. Yeah, I knew you were going to. Something made me. Something. I knew that was coming. I knew that. Listen, I knew that was coming. Uh, uh, that was coming. Uh, Boris, please. Yeah. Take yeah. it. Take it in the spirit it's meant. <laughs> so, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. So, this is your 80th film, or going on that way toward 80 movies now? And, uh, and I, guess I have no idea. More, I'm sure it must be. Yeah. Somebody yeah. counted. And, and more to come. Well, we'll see. I mean, I haven't done a film since this League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and uh, I'm reading stuff at the moment, and um, who knows? 
which way the wind blows. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Connery, thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you. My thanks to Sean Connery, Boris Johnson.